ask the question, what else you could do to optimize your earning for your income tax? One of the first things you do kind of make sure to look at, you know, what are your assets? So their income went up 186%. Their net income went up 141%. That's going to help determine which types of investments you're able to get into. And an investment, you can spend $100,000, you get $200,000 back. You don't need to have an LLC to invest. You don't have, you don't pay income tax if you don't have income, right? And you can design it as you kind of go. In real estate world, owning the actual real estate usually is best as a disregarded entity or as a partnership. If there are taxable gains or taxable income, there's going to be a drag. That's gonna set the tone of the return and how you keep the tax as you know. Uh, Q3, Q4 series, uh, we wanted to talk about the optimizing the income tax because this is the time mostly we get into that uh, year end uh, taxation purposes. So our I mean, our ask is that be proactive, uh, and be proactive, look at your earning this year and ask the question, what else you can do to optimize your earning for your income tax? So last week we talked a little bit about depreciation about what's happening this year, how it's stepping down next year, and how you can use the depreciation. We didn't talk about a case study really, uh, but we'll share a little bit more. And then we'll dive really into that, okay, we have the tools that we can execute on, but then how do we stage ourselves into the tools? And this is where, and a lot of people will go, a lot of big, you know, big law firms, attorneys, all CPAs, and all this kind of other stuff, and just like and us as well. So I had one of my team, I asked them, give me the playbook, uh, give us the framework. So we'll talk about the framework a little bit more and I wanna get Bill's thought as you kind of go through. So it's gonna be an interesting one. Okay, so things that we're gonna to cover today, so mentioning is a taxable income as a family. It's an example to kind of prime you uh, that what really happens and then framework of the tax optimization. It's one slide, mostly we're gonna spend a lot of time there. And last thing is the live case study, which is Bill and I, we're gonna debate about it. Uh, so scenario one, just to set up a context, what the basis of conversation today, uh, this is the old one. It's a fictitious number. Please don't hold me to it. I attempted, it. So I went back 2021, 2020. So nobody says uh, nothing about it. So in this fictitious uh, scenario, this family, it's a married filing jointly. If you look at top, their tax bracket, 24%, went up to 35%. In year 2020, they aren't together, husband and wife, working couple. Uh, their total income was roughly $308,000. Now, they work really, really hard. And they had a business, uh, probably husband and a wife. I know one party worked in W-2, the other party had a business. They almost doubled their income, right? You know, they almost doubled, literally said doubled. So they, in, their payment and their income went up by almost $270,000, right? If you look at the other, uh, at the bottom right here, the total tax, you know, beautifully, uh, went up from $50,000, $48,000 to $153,000. And if you look at all the way down to the bottom right here in the blue, uh, it's, they earned in year 2020 about $300,000. And year 2022, uh, 2021, they earned, they, they took home roughly $423,000. So the Delta, uh, the year before, they took 98% of whatever they earned. Year after, they took 74% of what they earned. So thanks to Uncle Sam, they left a lot of money on the table. Now the question becomes, you know, why, right? Even though their income went up by 186%, their net income went up by 141%. So they just spread that they kept. And that is because of the income, you know, that they have, right? So the side business. So the question here is, Bill is here, we're gonna talk about it and you know, how, how does real estate fits into this picture? And if it does, what would happen? And then what's the overall picture looks like, right? So on, on that note, uh, to kind of close out the last weeks, what we talk about here, let's see, we're in a real estate domain and we're going to invest, you know, uh, this is available tools in our toolkit. So one of the benefits of investing in commercial real estate is that you get the depreciation. You may or may not be able to use it the year off that you get it, depending on your staging part of it, that we'll talk about it. But you get the depreciation, at least the best case you get to use it today, worst case you get to use it next year or whenever you have another income coming through. So quick example, let's say we have two investments and I need some tax write-offs, right? What happens on the top, we spend $100,000. In three years down the way, we get a $171,000 back. 
good return, healthy return, 20%, perfect, makes a lot of sense. That's on the top. That does not have a cost segregation, right? And then at the bottom right here, there is a, an investment, you can spend $100,000, you get $200,000 back, right? Five years down the way. But then on the top, doesn't have a cost segregation, probably it's a, you know, it's a, it's a new development project, one down below, uh, it's a multifamily probably, or that's you know, you know, uh, some kind of a retail space or a building that has bathrooms and kitchens, right? It can write off a lot of things. The benefit at the bottom one, on top of that $200,000, one on the right, you get the depreciation. So you get right off roughly $72,000 of paper loss, 50% of that year one, and then it kind of steps down. So oftentimes, that is the benefit on top of the benefits of the return. So what happens? This is the time we get the phone calls from our business owners. Hey, Shariar, our earning will be half a million or quarter million or a million. My, my tax position is this. And what's the best way to optimize it for this year? Or what the best way to optimize it now so I can really get the benefit next year? So depreciation is one of the options that we do. And uh, for, for if you are... Again, this is the other one. So if you're working on it, um, if you are looking at your PL, talking to your CPA, talking to a tax strategist, ask the question what you can do. Uh, this is the example that I was trying to do that. Get depreciation as much as you can. You may be able to use it this year, which is great. And if you can't, that's fine because you still get a big chunk of depreciation now. So you can use it down the way because that becomes yours. And the biggest issue is, is going away, right? So that's the, so just keep in mind, our ask was last week, the same as this week, go talk to your CPA, go talk to a tax strategy, understand how much you're going to earn this year, and then take action about it and kind of go from there. So uh, let's let's get into the next uh, section of it, right? So the question that Bill and I will be talking about it, it's really the end objective is how to optimize the tax return. And as we do that, how we can leverage uh, real estate investing and to do that, can we do anything else in terms of a staging of the information so you can get the benefits down the way? Okay, so context of the next slide, and Bill, I'll get you in. So again, this is educational purposes only. Uh, so we asked the question to our uh, a legal team that I work with, say, hey, give me a playbook. This slide alone will cost you more than $10,000. And a part of this, we talk about it during our events and more, so you get to play with it. So always remember, you, you, you are an active investor, you will be an active investor. So it's, you need to work towards an active investment philosophy as you can build a portfolio for you. To do that, you need to start with the staging and then continue playing with it alongside with the goal. And some of the things that we talk about here, we made our fair share of mistakes. We learned a little bit, we're gonna get better. All right, so first thing is it's a lot. Again, it's a lot, but we'll talk about it specifically. We asked the question, how many different ways you can do investments, right? Uh, they gave us about almost a dozen, right? We have estate planning, we have offshore trust, living trust, traditional LLC, and with the solo 401k, self-directed IRA. And the second half is the parent or the series LLC, then child series land trust, the property syndication assets, then the nonprofits and defined benefit plan. Someone who's making $10 million a year, uh, probably they have done it all. And someone's starting, you know, probably you'll start with five or six or four, five and six, then work your way up to three, work your way up to nine and things like that. And then we'll kind of talk this through as you go. All right. So and then, you know, we are, again, uh, us being us, we want to get a little bit more complicated. We said, look, take this, but I don't understand how it flows. What's the hierarchy, right? What goes where and how? Can you optimize the hierarchy? Because if I understand the organizational legal structure hierarchy, I can place the project this way. I can place my money a certain way, right? All right, time to get more confused. So here uh, is the chart that they gave us. So each of those numbering on the left matches with the numbering on the right. So you can follow how, who fits in where. So I'll give you a version of it, how I understood it. So Bill, then I'll ask a bunch of questions and you can help me out with it. So if we are an individual or individuals or something that typically will have a state plan and depending on where you add, you may, not, may or may not have a not for profit but the state plan ideally, what they say should be an offshore trust. That one thought we don't. So we go straight to number three. We ask, do we have number three? 
know, with the living trust, it could be seven, you know, from here, you can go this way, a traditional LLC. And then if you get really um, sophisticated about it, you can, you can hide behind the firewall. It's tough to get it, right? Uh, the 4 and 4A are the typical uh, where we start, all of us, we start. Underneath the four, we have five, six, which is the solo 401k and what we call a self-directed IRA. Uh, so that's where most of us will start uh, from LLC, then, then five and six. And then as we get better, we get into seven, which is we start doing a trust and the series LLC, a bunch of other stuff. It gets so complicated, right? Now, it was interesting. I was talking to this with an attorney. I was like, you know, why do an LLC, right? So to us, uh, before I get into the tax side of it, so the joke is, in a typical conventional mindset, uh, LLC does um, you know, protect between something to the owners of the LLC, right? So the veil is there. At the same time, if you get the right side of attorney, you can go through those corporate veils one thing at a time. It's just the time and the money game, rather whether I am protected or not, right? So, so it's a slippery slope. So nothing is there, nothing is here bulletproof, but you can add so many layers, you could design a certain way. So if something were to happen, you're fine. So just on that note, whenever someone says and scares you out, remember that there's nothing absolutely 100% perfect. Over time we graduate, we typically go from four, then a five, then a six, then a seven. And then as we, you know, if we're really, really active, doing a lot of things, you do serious, otherwise, most live in trust and it happens. But our recommendation is everybody should have a trust. It's easier that way or have a state plan. On that note, tonight, we're going to talk about the LLC. Bill, from your perspective, my first question, let's say I'm a brand new guy. I just started. I have a corporate job. I want to get into real estate. What's the first thing should I do based on this one? One of the first things you kind of make sure look at, you know, what are your assets? Do you qualify as what's called an accredited investor? because that's going to help determine which types of investments you're able to get into. Certain ones require you have a certain income level or a certain number of assets. Unlocks the key to get into certain investments. Next, determine how much money you want to invest. And okay, while I don't want to sound scary, you have to understand there's no guarantee you're going to make money, you could lose money. So kind of like, okay, where, where, where are you willing to go with this? Then start thinking about like what you're comfortable with, you know, your, your, your level of where you want to do and where do you want to invest? Like, do you want to invest in your same state or outside of your state? Then you kind of start looking at like, where's the money going to come from? Like, is your money currently sitting in your IRA, currently sitting in a retirement account, sitting in a savings account? Because where you've got now there, you know, four, five, six, 12, those will help to determine where you're going to pull the funds from in order to invest. Then finally, it's kind of like, you know, how involved do you want to be? Do you want to be a passive, give somebody else your money? And really, the nice thing is, all you got to go is, hey, you got my bank account? Okay, when do I get my first check? I'm passive. Don't want to be the active investor. I way prefer just to, I just get, you know, the direct deposit done for my distributions. You don't need to have an LLC to invest. Some people may need to. And those people typically know when they need to. If you're not sure, then you probably don't need one. Um, it's, I'm sorry, real estate means so many different things. You could invest in a syndication. You can have a partnership with somebody else. You can own it by yourself. So it kind of depends on what you're doing. I, I'm going to kind of talk more about like passive investing here. For passive investing, you may not need one unless you're looking, it's going to some other type of bigger estate plan. You might have an LLC. You might even have an LP, like a family limited partnership. And a lot of these things are going to pair up with, okay, how do you want to have your assets passed after you die? You know, how do you want to distribute them? Uh, some people may like, I, I don't care, I'm dead, you know, but uh, it does make things a lot easier for those that receive them. Um, and depending on how you have a tax, like most LLCs, it's going to make it a lot less taxing if you have it set up now for those people to inherit it. If I, let's say, you know, I don't, and I don't think so. I need an LLC to invest. I have $100,000 in my account. I want to invest. And should I not have the LLC to start with and then go with it? You know, cost you so $300 to set it up anyways. They're really wrong or bad to have an LLC, 
But nine times out of 10, I mean, if you're passively investing in a deal, you, you don't really need one. Okay, I'm not the attorney. This is not me giving legal advice. I'm telling you what attorneys tell me, that unless you're going to be the one named on the title, unless you're owning the property directly, or if you're going in partnership with somebody else, again, to put your name on the property, nine times out of 10, just you can just own it individually. You don't need to own it through an LLC. It's kind of like putting two pieces of paper on the toilet seat, you know, before you sit down. So yeah. it, it doesn't really give you a whole lot of extra protection. The entity itself, the LLC or limited partnership that owns the entity itself, that's the one that's important. You're investing inside of that one. And so you're going to get your income and your cash flow from that entity, not from the actual bricks and mortar itself. Got it. Nope. Point well taken. So what if someone is moving to transition out from their corporate job into a business? Should they not start with an LLC so they become bankable over time? Okay. So now if somebody is looking, so it's not so much the real estate, but it depends on what the person is doing. If they're looking to start setting up their own business and create a real operating company, not just one, you know, that's going to be, you know, $5 a year, or they're creating it just for other things they think are benefits. No, no. Having an LLC, if you have an operating company, becomes very important, especially because like some of those things below it, setting up your solo 401k plan, setting up your defined benefit plan. Uh, so, you know, for liability protection, it, it can be a good vehicle. And there's never anything wrong, per se, with having one. It's just that sometimes it's like giving you this great plan that's going to save you all this money. And, you know, it costs $50,000 to set up. It's not always appropriate for every person in the right situation, it's exactly correct, you know, but it's kind of like, so there's really not one size fits all. It's kind of one of those, maybe one of the best things, what I should have did first was like, okay, talk with somebody, kind of get an idea of what you're getting into. Hey, what, what, what am I looking at like for tax wise? What am I looking at for dollars spending on this thing? You know, what, what am I looking at? Well, you know, what do I need to set up? And then as you set these things up now, whether you have an LLC or not, everybody should have a will. Well, okay, put it this way. If you don't have one, don't worry. The state has one for you. Unfortunately, the state tends to be the one that gets the biggest beneficiary of it. So you, you absolutely want to have one because you want to have a little say so in where your stuff goes. Uh, but so an LLC can be a part of that bigger plan. And and uh, that, I while you can set your own up, I advise you talk with an attorney because depending on what you're using it for, you don't always need it set up correctly until you need it correctly. And by that time, it's too late to go back and redo the paperwork. Well, so on, on that note, if you're, let's say you are, you want to be active, you're looking to be a GP, or you're looking to raise capital, we recommend that have an LLC, oh, yeah. company LLC over Absolutely. time, it's going to help you out as you go. Now, also, like, say somebody that's going to, you, if you're going to form an LLC, you may want to consider, you know, okay, why are you doing it? So you've got there number seven, the series LLC, and so what a series LLC is, it's, so first of all, I get this question a lot or I ask a lot, you know, like when I, when someone tells me they have an LLC and I say, ask them like, okay, so, so how is your LLC taxed? They kind of look at me and they go as an LLC. And then it's like, okay, it's not wrong. It's just one of those, technically there's no such thing as being taxed as an LLC. If you have an LLC, which means limited life, it's limited liability company. It's not limited liability corporation. It's limited liability company. To the IRS, that just means, okay, you got a business, but how do you want to report your income? Because that exact same LLC, it could be self-employed. It could be a partnership. It could be a C corporation. It could be an S corporation. It could be a benefit plan. It could be a nonprofit. It could be all kinds of things. But depending on what you want to use it for, you could do a regular LLC or you could do a what's called a series LLC. And now a series LLC, if y'all know what like an accordion file is, it's one of those. So when you've got the lid closed, it looks like it's just one folder. But if you open it up inside of that folder are 20 different pockets. That's what a series LLC is. It allows you to close the lid and file taxes for one company, but if you open the lid up 
inside of them is technically a different LLC. And technically, each one of them would protect the others from liability. So if number one gets sued, number two is not going to be held liable for it. But this way, you don't have to file 50 different tax returns. It's one of them. They all wrap up to one parent company. Let's say, we, you know, I have a job, I have a business, and we're earning, and we are investing directly uh, from our, you know, individual name versus my wife is investing via an LLC. When that depreciation comes back or when that return comes back, how does that roll up? That comes to my social rolls up and that yep. goes to her EIN so number, then her social to me? How does that work? This kind of comes back. So if you own it individually, it goes back to your social security number. And if you're in a community property state and you're married, that means it's going to go to your joint tax return which could be very important because in case you were to do a real estate professional, only one spouse has to be a real estate professional for both spouses to get the benefit. Usually when I see an LLC owned by one person for real estate, they're usually what are called disregarded entities. That's another way of saying for IRS purposes, make pretend there's no LLC to begin with. You just prepare the taxes as if there was never an LLC to begin with. You have an LLC, and for asset protection, you have one at the state level. But for the IRS, they're like, yeah, don't even worry about it. Don't even tell us you have one. It's okay. Um, now, but that same LLC could become a partnership. It could be in community property state like Texas, both spouses own it it's also considered you have the option to be disregarded. Where disregarded comes into a benefit, okay, real truth, you don't have to pay an extra $3,000 for a CPA to prepare your partnership return. It just goes straight on your personal taxes, 1040, for pretty much exactly the same tax bill that you're gonna get. I say pretty much the same because, well, if you pay $3,000 to get it prepared, you're gonna get that as a deduction, but uh, I don't recommend it. It becomes important again, because like that LLC could be different things, in real estate world, owning the actual real estate usually is best as a disregarded entity or as a partnership. There become limitations on it if you own it in an S corporation or a C corporation. So it doesn't mean you don't want to do it. So there's reason like usually when I see it as somebody who is a foreign national, someone who's not from the United States not a U.S. resident. They don't have to be a citizen, but they, if they're not a resident, and so therefore they're not paying taxes in the U.S. as a resident or what y'all might consider a citizen, sometimes a corporation is a better option for them. Uh, now, service companies, management companies, S corporations are great, but for owning the actual real estate or investing passively in another deal, typically they're better owned as disregarded or as a partnership because there's less limitations on them. Now, going back, let's say I invested side by side. You, know, uh, you invested with the LLC. I invested in my solo 401k, right? Money came back out, same profit. Uh, how does that work? Who gets to keep more money? Usually it, it's no. So we, I'm talking like if everything is done and sold because yeah. outside of the 401k, if there are taxable gains or taxable income, there's going to be a drag. There's ways to avoid that. Well, defer that. You know, it's defer, 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 die. You know, and one out of every one people die. So you can generally defer it. But just in a simple terms, if you own it individually, one person, one brother owns it, one brother has it inside the solo 401k, the solo 401k is going to have a longer time to defer those tax. And when it comes out, depending on, because in a solo K, the nice thing is you might do Roth. And Roth 401k means when you eventually take it out, it's all tax-free. You paid once up front, and then it's free on the back end. There's some catches to it, like you got to be 59 years old or retired, different things along those lines. Now, IRA is good that it can defer a lot of the income tax, but along the way, you could be getting hit with a 20% tax on the income, even inside the IRA. There's certain taxes called UBIT. It doesn't mean IRAs are a bad thing to invest in. It just means you probably want to make sure if you're going to use IRA money, 
you know what you're getting into. Lots of people do them. They're wonderful. Self-directed IRAs are a great vehicle to use. It's just make sure you understand what you're getting into. I prefer the solo 401k or a self-directed 401k. However, because it does not have to worry about the UBIT, but it does mean you actually have to have an operating business. You can't set one up just because well, I don't want to pay the UBIT, so I'm going to set up a solo 401k. No, no, you actually have to have a real business. You have to grease the skids every now and then. You have to earn profit, defer your money into the 401k. There, there's certain requirements that you have to go through in order to make it you know, a true operating entity. For, from our perspective, what it does is that if you go for the velocity of the return, that means you want to get uh, you know your money back faster, uh, giving all things equal. Uh, then you know, four one k it's a it's a Roth bucket. It's a good place to start. And if you want to get a tax optimized and you know, a return uh, coming directly from LLC or from you individually, it's a better. And that's what it seems to be, right, Bill? Yeah, and I, and I have both myself. I, I think it's a good idea sometimes to have both. I have a solo four hundred one k that invests in real estate. I have also just you know, regular individual name investing. They're both good for different reasons. Um, another nice thing I like about the self-directed IRAs and the solo 401k, no state income taxes. So if in Texas, we don't always see it, but if you invest outside the state of Texas, some other states, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, you might have to file a state income tax return. You don't have to do that with the self-directed IRA, the solo 401k. Uh, but you do when you have to own it. Even if you have losses, there may be requirements of filing individually. Again, one of those things, kind of make sure when you're getting into it. Another thing said, yep. I'm, I'm invested outside of Texas. There's nothing wrong with investing outside of Texas as long as you just understand what you're getting into. Yeah, 100%. So we have investment, as I was mentioning earlier, in four different states. We love those states for different reasons. We knew how the information is going to flow in. We make the decision that way. And so we always say, build your portfolio mix and match it up where does the money come from so when you when you get the returns it has a different kind of protection layer and then also when you invest your money in and you know, roll that up across different asset classes asset types geographical location and and the different time frequency that way your your money is always moving at a different point of time money is also coming back right if you stack a couple of threes with a couple of fives what happens? Something happens in the three something happens in the year four something happens in the year five versus if you stack all year five it's just one, one long wait time. At the same way, if you have one type of strategy that you build your portfolio with, just a value add in a certain location, then everything is geographically located into one spot. When a swing happens, you are really exposed to the risk that you have. But if you distribute it out, different state behave a different way, different cities will behave a different way. So your portfolio will behave accordingly as well, right? So it's a, so let me kind of bring it down all the way, make it kind of simplify. So available tools in our toolkit. Number one, try work with your CPA again. Try to reduce your taxable income. Uh, that's one of the ways is you increase your tax deduction depending on who you are, what you do. You may or may not be able to do that, right? Then look for tax credits. You time income and deductions. Number four, number five is restructuring an investment for tax efficiency. We have seen that quite a time. You take the equity profit out from the stock market, from the equity market, then you roll that back into real estate or vice versa, right? So get all those things right, have a plan. And the last thing is number six and seven, improve your tax knowledge and work with the tax professional. It is extremely powerful. Like if we don't do anything, just reduce our you know, with the um, number number five, and if we can impact the number one, that's a huge impact. Cash flow and taxable income are not the same thing. Right. So you work at a job, you understand, you know, in America, gross does not equal net. Other countries, they understand net, but it's like you make a hundred thousand, but you only take home sixty thousand. So are you making a hundred? Are you making sixty? A lot of these real estate, they're kicking off these distributions. You don't have to make a hundred. You only have to make sixty to replace your check. If you're not having to pay the tax on it, if you're able to defer the tax, you really only need sixty. And so, again, make sure you're understanding. There's cash flow and there's taxable income, and they're not the same thing. And don't let the tax tail wag the dog. You know, don't taxes are important, but don't get paralyzed. And what am I going to do because of the taxes? Sometimes you you know just got to go with it. 